All right, so hey guys, how's it going? So today I'm going to be going through my lecture on statistics and data analysis for uh, medical physics research. And uh, today I have 14 questions to go through. Uh, and I'll, I'll split it up into two separate lectures. The first lecture covering questions 1 through 7, and the uh, second covering uh, 8 through 14. I'd say each lecture will probably be around 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes long. Now, with respect to this lecture, um, I, I based it primarily on uh, concepts uh, involving both data analysis and statistics that would be uh, directly applicable to the field of medical physics, uh, particularly medical physics research. I think overall it's, a, it's an excellent lecture. And it's it's very um, it, it covers a lot of ground in only uh, fourteen questions or uh, two twenty minute lectures. Uh, so, with that being said, let's begin. Okay, so um, this first slide here, I just wanted to kind of go through some housekeeping uh, ideas, just some general concepts on data analysis and statistics. Um, so for statistics, if possible, try to use uh, basic statistics rather than advanced. You know things like standard deviations or calculating means. Um, in the event that you are using advanced statistics, be very careful because in many instances when you're applying them, there are going to be uh, many assumptions involved. Um, so if you're using advanced statistics, you are going to have to research the formalism. Um, so for data analysis, a uh, similar idea, try and use simple data analysis methods, say for example uh, linear regression or magnitude comparison. Um, you know, For linear data analysis, you can visually or mathematically check if your answer uh, is correct. You'll be able to tell. But Say, for example, you're using uh, nonlinear data analysis. You, you, you can't really tell uh, by the result if it's correct. Um, or sorry, you, you can tell by the result, but you can't really check to see if uh, the process is correct because it's very complicated. Um, if you are applying, for example, nonlinear fitting to data analysis, your best bet is to use a software program. Like um, a good example would be, you could download a MATLAB script and then uh, enter in your data, and then just have that apply the nonlinear fitting. It'll run a program for a number of iterations. You can do this uh, similar thing within uh, Mathematica and other programs. Um, but yeah, when using nonlinear fitting or model fitting, there's always going to be lots of assumptions made, so you have to be very careful. So um, this is just an example workflow that I made up. Um, so uh, if you're using advanced statistics and data analysis, the first thing you want to do is research a publication um, that uses the, the statistic or analysis, and then compare if that situation is comparable to, to uh, your work, your, your research. Uh, the application of it. Research the assumptions made for the application of it and then you can go ahead and apply the statistic analysis to your data and then assess the result. Is that an appropriate result and what does it mean? Okay so let's work through some problems. Um, so for part A, what is the formula for calculating the mean? All you're doing is adding up the measurements and dividing by how many there are. Uh, for B, let's do an example calculation add up the number of measurements. I hit five golf balls the following distances. Calculate the mean distance. Add them up. Divide by how many? Five. For C and D. Um, so there's a distinction here in standard deviation, the formula. That's what I want to point out here. Um, so for part C, it's what's a standard deviation for a total sample as compared to a standard deviation for a fraction of a total sample. Essentially what you're doing is uh, with the total sample, you're using the uh, n will be the total number of measurements. If you're using a fraction of the sample, you're going to take that number of measurements and subtract one from it. 
and then work through the standard deviation. I, I've showed it in uh, how to calculate standard deviation in I think several of my other videos, but I'll, I'll show you again quickly. Um, so for E, let's calculate standard deviation for both examples. Um, so I have the mean calculated at 39.8. I'll sub it in. I'll subtract each measurement. Bam, bam, bam. In an atom, of course, as it's the uh, sum up. And then uh, this is an example of um, this is going to be the standard deviation uh, for a fraction of a total sample. Notice that we took the number of measurements and subtracted one. And then I work it out, just bad math here, and then I get uh, 18.23. So for the total sample, the only difference is I'm going one over five measurements. So problem two. Um, let's say we have uh, two numbers, each with uncertainties of measurement. How do you add or subtract the uncertainties? So in this example, if I uh, want to add two measurements, they each have uncertainty. You're going to want to, and I want to calculate the uncertainty of the result of the addition. You're going to want to square each uncertainty. Add, square, take the square root. Now how would you do it, how would you uh, multiply or divide uncertainties? Um, so to calculate the re, uh, resulting uncertainty, you're going to take the result uh, number, take the square root of uh, the uncertainty in uh, the first quantity, divided by the measurement A squared plus uh, the uncertainty of B uh, divided by B squared square root. Uh, so a little bit tricky to memorize. Uh, part C, definitely tricky to memorize. If a number with an uncertainty has an exponential, how do you calculate the uncertainty in a result? Um, so in this case, if the result is equal to, uh, if C is equal to uh, A, a term to the exponent N, you can calculate the um, uncertainty of the result by multiplying it by the exponent, measurement A, exponent minus 1, and then the uncertainty measurement of A. So essentially, um, it's very easy to, I think, look past these calculations. But it's very important because um, in many instances, if you're looking at uh, research publication, they're probably going to be showing values of uncertainty uh, within the measurement. And you're going to be thinking, how, how, do, how did they calculate this? So you may have to uh, use these methods. A quick example in D. Uh, the sides of a rectangle are measured, 15.3 and 9.6. Each length has uncertainty of 0.07. Calculate the area of the rectangle, including its uncertainty. So the area, of course, is length times width. I get my answer. Let's calculate the uh, uncertainty multiplication. There's my answer. See? Square root of the uncertainty over the value plus uncertainty over the value, and then just bed mass from there. OK, so a little bit of uh, data analysis. What is a linear regression, or r squared? Essentially, a linear regression R squared, it's a line of best fit um, through your data points. If you look here, this would be a linear regression, the red line through your data points. Um, it, it tells you how strong a linear relationship there is between two variables. When do we use it? When do we use linear regression? Um, so we're going to be using it on scatter plot data, like in this example. Um, and there should be a relationship between the X and Y values. Why do we need it? So generally speaking, we use this uh, line of best fit so that we're able to make predictions and trends about the data. It also allows us to find the likelihood of future events past the data within the predicted outcomes. And uh, the idea is that if more samples are added and we have this coefficient, we could, we could determine the probability of a new point falling on the line. What programs can calculate linear regression for you? Uh, many, many programs. Excel, Origin, SPSS, and every other data analysis program. So linear regression is very common. Um, for E, if you wanted to, how do you calculate linear regression manually? Uh, you're going to be using this term, which is the correlation coefficient. This is quite a uh, nasty formula. If we look at just this term, it's the sum of all x and y values added. So that's just that one term. Sum of x, sum of y. Some of x squared, some of x then squared. So 
it's quite an, a uh, large formula. Then you're going to go ahead and square this uh, correlation coefficient to get your R squared. And then if you want, you can multiply it by 100 to get it as a percentage. Uh, so what four assumptions must occur to use a linear regression? Relationship between the variables linear. The difference in the real and predicted values is uh, more of a constant. Residuals are distributed randomly, and the residuals are normally distributed. Um, yeah, so in other words, your scatter plot data, it should essentially just be nice uh, randomly distributed data. It shouldn't be um, you know, heavily weighted on one side or so forth. Um, what is the what is an independent variable and a dependent variable? Independent variable, it's, uh, it's when the variation does not depend on the other. This is typically your x variable. Your dependent variable depends on the other variable. So this is your y variable, typically. And let's just go through some examples, and you can tell me if you can use a linear regression or not. Okay, so this example, uh, two different sets of data, looks pretty good to me, but can you apply a linear regression? The answer is no. Because uh, if you look at the blue data, it follows a quadratic shape. Second set of data, nope, the residuals are not distributed normally. Third set of data, the answer is yes, it looks, uh, looks good. And the fourth set, yep. Because the residuals essentially they're random. So now problem five. Uh, how do you calculate the coefficient of variation? It's essentially just your standard deviation divided by your mean. And when do you use it? You know, why would you want to use the coefficient of variation? Well, it's a measure of spread that describes the amount of variability relative to the mean. But the, the, the key thing with the uh, coefficient of variation is the question that always comes up is why would you use it as, why would you just use a standard deviation? Why would you use the COV? The reason why is because the COV is unitless. Standard deviation has a unit, mean has a unit, they cancel out. So you get a COV value which is unitless. Um, so it's very valuable because you can compare across different variables. It's a unitless measurement. Um, so that's the idea. Um, so in other words, what does it mean if the, CO, if the coefficient of variation is high? The higher the COV, the greater the level of dispersion around the mean. Um, part D, this is related to linear regression. I just wanted to throw this in here. Uh, how do you calculate an error of estimation from a line of best fit or a linear regression? doesn't have to do with the COV. <laughs> um, so in this case, error of estimation from a line of best fit can be calculated by uh, square root of the sum of, this is the um, y variable of your data, minus this is the y variable of your line of best fit, this y prime. And you're going to go ahead and take a difference of them. Square root, this is number of measurements. And you can go ahead and calculate your error of estimation uh, from a line of best fit. Okay, um, so now we're going to start getting into a little bit more uh, statistics oriented components, um, but very valuable for medical physics research. This is problem six. This is run me through the entire procedure of hypothesis testing. So, okay, so first off, you essentially you want to state your null. Oh, and I'll be going through each one of these and show lots of examples. This is going to be the uh, the essence of um, the rest of the the lecture. Um, of the two lectures, and uh, I think I'll finish off with uh, a couple questions on chi-square. Um, okay, but let's just go through this quick, because I'll be going through it uh, very carefully after. Uh, state the null and alternate hypothesis. State a significance level. This is also called alpha. Decide a test statistic, z-test, t-test, or f-test. Then go ahead and calculate the value of the statistic. And then from the value of these statistics, we calculate a p-value, and then we can compare the p-value with the calculated value, and then we can either accept the uh, null hypothesis or reject the null hypothesis. Uh, last question for this lecture. Uh, what is a degree of freedom? So essentially what a degree of freedom is, 
It's an estimate of the number of independent pieces of information uh, that went into calculating the estimate. So in other words, it's just um, like the number of measurements minus one. So if I said, um, you know, if I hit four golf balls at four different distances, and I say, how many degrees of freedom is that? The answer is four minus one. There's three. Um, what does a tail mean? So this concept of tails, it's um, it's used in statistics. What it's referring to is if you have a hypothesis, um, it allows you to calculate, um, like, say, for example, if your experimental evidence is um, supporting the null hypothesis or rejecting it, you, you, you're going to be setting a uh, alpha value. Essentially, um, you can decide on what, what kind of tail you'd like. It could be two tails, um, which covers um, left side and the right. It could be one tail being right tail. It could be one tail being left tail. But the idea is that this particular, these tails, they're called um, critical areas, where if you're able to calculate a value within this critical area, you will calculate the critical area. If you're able to calculate a value within this critical area, it's going to be um, supporting your alternate hypothesis. And then just going through the hypothesis, what is the null hypothesis by definition? Oh, here's C and D. What's the null hypothesis? What's the alternate hypothesis? So the null hypothesis, it's the accepted standard fact um, for your experiment. The alternate hypothesis, um, it can be noted by ha or h1. I'm used to calling it ha, so ho and ha. The alternate hypothesis, it's the newly claimed experimental hypothesis. So just a quick example. Let's say I've got a new drug and it claims to raise your IQ point by 30 points. Your null hypothesis, which is your accepted standard, is going to be that after I take the drug, the average IQ will be the same. The alternate hypothesis, is the newly claimed. This is after I take the drug, the IQ will be 30 points higher. So I think um, it's very easy to describe um, example. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and we'll go through the entire process carefully. Um, if you're stuck or you don't quite understand you know, some of the other concepts, don't worry. So we'll go through it slowly with many examples. And uh, certainly you will uh, by the time I've gone through the uh, both lectures. So with that, uh, I'll catch you on problems 8 through 14. That's all. Bye.